This lecture is taking you through the crime control and prevention methods that are put forward by sociologists and in particular by the left and right realists. So it might be an idea here to pause this lecture and go back and just review left and right realist causes of crime as it will closely link with the theories that we're going to look at today. So we're going to look at situational, environmental and social, social and community crime prevention. Now there is a fourth one, which is surveillance, but we'll look at that separately in the next lecture. So we are now working on the crime control and prevention ISB. So that's the next one in your notebook. So to just so that you know where to look for your notes grid and the work that will go with this lecture. So your task for this lesson is to watch the video and using this plus the other resources that are available both linked to the ISB and listed in your remote learning plans and the ISBs etc to take notes on the different crime control and prevention methods how they work and evaluations of them so both their strengths and their limitations and the evidence I will be looking for is for you to have highlighted the notes grid showing me your levels of confidence with each box. Now it is important if you identify anything where it's I don't get it or I need help with this, that you actually, <coughs> excuse me, ask for help. That you contact me, you email me, send me a message on Teams, however you want to do it. But it's not enough that you just to highlight it and say I don't get it. You've actually got to do something about it. So you need to be proactive and let me know. The first theory we're going to look at um, of crime prevention comes from the left realists. So because the left realists are looking at causes of crime in terms of social issues and social problems that lead to criminal activity, they're going to look for social solutions. And this is where the social crime and community crime prevention comes in. So the first part of their prevention methodology, and remember, they're not looking at getting rid of crime in its entirety, they're just looking at reducing crime and its impact on society. So the first thing they look at is, or the main thrust of what they're looking at is, social, is a sense of community, which links very nicely into the work that we did on Hershey and Bond theory. So they believe that by creating a sense of community and looking at the social problems caused by relative deprivation, poverty, marginalization and subcultures, they're able to reduce some of the criminal activity, but they're aware that they can't reduce it all. They can't get rid of crime. They can only reduce it. So the first thing they talk about is community projects. And what they're talking about here is things like youth groups, community centers that help create that sense of community. And if you remember back to Hershey and Bond theory, a sense of community, a sense of belonging and involvement in your community, a bond with your community will prevent people from committing crime because they don't want to let their community down. It also enables them to be to create um, informal social control and create that sense of other the, the not the police and the military, but friends, family, peers, local people keep an eye out on each other, not in a creepy kind of neighborhood watchy kind of way, but more of a kind of you shouldn't really be doing that. You, this is not what our community is about, that that kind of. Um, I can't think of the word, but that sort of thing that will help to prevent criminal activity. They talk about parenting groups to help parents socialize their children into norms and values and creating um, the idea that it takes a village to raise a family. It's not an individual endeavor. And the community, pro there, there is evidence that these community projects can work. In particular is a study called the Perry Preschool Program which was a longitudinal study which took place from 1962 right through to the early 90s. And I'm going to take you through that a little bit more detail now. So the Perry Preschool Programme was put forward, but was a study done by David Wickert et al. There were, were others involved 
in Michigan in the United States and it was a longitudinal study that took started in the early 60s and went right through to the mid 90s um, late 90s and what it was was what so what they did was they took um, 123 African-American children in impoverished neighborhoods in Michigan and they divided them into two groups the first group were the groups that were going to receive the preschool program from 1962 to 1967 from the ages of three to um, seven or eight and then they had a control group now they tried to make it match pairs so that each group had roughly the same socioeconomic and gender makeup and things like that um, it obviously wasn't possible to do a complete match pairs because we're humans but they tried to make it as much of a match pair as they could so that way that when they compared the data from both groups um, they could see the impact of the preschool program so what the preschool program entailed was the group that were in the program would receive two and a half hours daily with a teacher where the ratio was about six students to one teacher and they would complete a program that dealt with I guess it would be called soft skills things like teamwork problem solving it wasn't really focused on academics in in terms of English maths and science and things like that it was more about creating social behaviors and developing social behaviors um, and what they also did was they had the teachers do weekly home visits to the parents that lasted about an hour and a half just to kind of see how things were going at home to to support the parents with the preschool program with any homework that may have been set um, reading a big thing was reading with their children um, and spending time with them getting them cooking and uh, gardening and things like that to, to try and develop these these what they called soft skills okay and what they did is the study itself monitored as I said engagement motivation and social behavior from the participants from the ages of 3 to 41 and by the end of the study they had a 97 percent of the sample remaining meaning majority of the participants that started in 1962 remained until the end of the study which helps to increase the, both the validity in terms of depth and the validity in terms of accuracy because there wasn't a high recidivism rate okay so what did they find out so when they when this study ended in uh, 1993 I think it was they compared the control group to the preschool group the program group in three main areas the first thing that they did was they looked at their academic achievements and what they found was that the children who went to the preschool outperformed those who didn't the control group with 71% of the program group graduating high school compared to 54% of the control group they also found that more of the program group went on to higher education so college university um, than the control group with the second thing they looked at was criminal behavior or, and crime and deviance and what they found here was that the program group the preschool group had lower rates of juvenile arrests on average 2.3 juvenile arrests compared to 4.6 in the control group and as adults that it became even more significant with um, 1.8 arrests on average in the uh, preschool group where there was four compared to four in the control group so we can see that the preschool did have an impact on criminal behavior and finally they looked at economics and what they found was by the age of 27 the program group had a higher earning potential and in fact were earning almost 60 percent more than the control group now what this means in terms of crime and deviance and the prevention of crime and deviance is that we can see that community projects can work we by having if we think about the causes of crime that we looked at in theories of crime and deviance things like 
status frustration caused by lower educational achievement, material deprivation and relative deprivation due to poverty. The preschool program showed that the children that went to those preschools not only earned more, so therefore were less likely to feel deprived, but they also had higher levels of education, which in opened opportunities for higher paying jobs. And they also and that links in with the lower rates of criminal behavior. So we can see that these community projects work. Okay. The second part of creating a sense of community is what's known as intervention projects. So the community projects are almost preemptive. They're, they're trying to prevent um, criminal activity and criminal behavior before it starts. The intervention projects are working for uh, families and, and people who perhaps already have got into problems and already are having issues. And an example here would be the Troubled Families program run here in the UK. And again, I'm going to take you through that in a bit more detail now. So the Troubled Families program was a development of a Labour government program that was put forward in the um, early 2000s. And it was kind of given a really big push by the Conservative government and rebranded because obviously everything had to be branded as Conservative. Um, and it was their idea, not they couldn't give uh, credit to the Labour Party, of, clearly not. Um, so the Troubled Family Programme was a uh, co Conservative government initiative put forward by David Cameron in 2011 following the, the riots that occurred um, during 2011. And the aim was to turn around 120,000 troubled families by May 2015. So the first thing we need to think of, what is a troubled family? How, do the, how were the government identifying families that required this intervention? And in 2011, they had um, four kind of key areas that they were looking at. The first was involvement with crime. So if a family had an under 18 who had a proven criminal conviction in the last 12 months, they got, they got a tick. If anyone in the family had an antisocial behaviour order or a stay home order or something along those lines within the last 12 months, they got another tick. They also looked at children and if children were not in school, they were considered to be troubled families. So these were children who had truanting problems. So their attendance at school would be lower than, say, 50 percent. Um, they either had been excluded or were on uh, permanently or had had three fixed term exclusions. So they were at school for a uh, period of time and then they went back or they were on in danger of becoming a permanent exclusion. And they also looked at students who were in pupil referral units or some form of alternative provision linked to social and behavioral problems. Um, then they also looked at adults who were out of work and on benefits. Uh, so we're not talking here about people who were on uh, disability um, benefits, but people who were f physically able to work, but currently were not and hadn't been for a significant period of time. So we're talking over a few years here. And also families who were cause, causing high costs to the taxpayer. So this is quite a broad category, a quite broad characteristic, and could include families who had issues with drugs or alcohol, if there was domestic violence in the home, if there was some form of uh, abuse within the home. Um, these were all people, were families who were considered high cost families to the taxpayer. Now, to qualify for the Troubled Families Initiative, the family had to tick three out of the criteria and then they could be brought into it. Now, initially in 2011, there were 54 local authorities, local councils who were taking part in the study in, in the program. This has now been expanded to over 100 um, as the program is still ongoing. So what did they actually do? The, the actual intervention was to give the family a key worker a social worker, somebody from the local authority who would work intensively with the family 
as David Cameron put it, from the inside out. So looking to address the problems within the family, helping them to access support and support networks to help them overcome barriers that were preventing them from getting into work or going to school or what were causing them to be into getting into trouble. And also encouraging them to take responsibility for their circumstances rather than waiting for the government to come in and bail them out or to um, solve the problem for them actually get the families to start thinking about what can we do? What can I do? How can I make this situation better? How can I get myself out of the cycle of poverty? So the, it, it's quite broad in terms of the interventions that were provided because it was very unique to the individual family. But the outcome, according to the government, is that um, over 90% of families were turned around. And to be considered turned around, the, the children had to be in school over 80, with attendance of over 85%. And they didn't go for 100% because, let's face it, kids get ill. Um, so it, it was over 85%. Youth crime in the family was reduced by 33%. Antisocial behaviour across the family dropped by 60%. And what they were looking at here is interactions with the police. So if the family's interactions with the police reduced by 33% or by 60% during their intervention, it was con they were then considered turned around. And additionally, if the adult in the family, one of, one of the adults, it could be a single parent family, it could be a, a two parent family, but one of the adults in the household was in work for three or six months continuously. To, and it depended on what their initial benefit they were receiving were as to whether they were on a three or six month um, turnaround. So the government, the Conservative government said that this was a success and then they expanded the programme in 2014 to include more categories of families or more f categories where families could then be involved in the Troubled Families programme and they are still saying that it is a success. Now, we do have to be a little bit cautious here because obviously government statistics can be manipulated and can be stretched a little to make it look like the policy is working, especially this sort of policy, which probably has quite a um, an expense attached to it. OK, and so you can see that the, these community projects and these intervention projects are about changing the social circumstances of individuals in order to make it so that crime is not something that they're turning to. The second way they created a sense of community, um, according to, to create a sense of community, according to Left Realist, is to look at the police force and look at how the police can become more ingrained within the local community. There's a statistic that suggests that um, something like 70% of crime is solved through public information, through the public giving the police information about a crime that has occurred in order to help solve it. The police can't be everywhere all day, every day. Um, so they, they need the public to come to them with information. Now, if there isn't good public relations with the community, that's not going to happen. So one of the things that the left realists put forward is creating more public um, relation, police, improving police relations, sorry, with the community by having things like the Bobby on the Beat, a community, a police officer who's known in the local community or a number of police officers who are known in the com local community where they have a set area that they are patrolling and their face gets known and they get known and they get involved in things community projects, community fates, games of football in the park with the kids, things like that that can kind of create this sense of they're part of our community. They're not external trying to control the community, but they're part of the community. Now, Kinsley and Lee and Young in 1986 also suggested that the police needed to be accountable to the local community that certain positions within the police force should be elected, but not nationally, locally. 
So the, the local ch police chief, similar to the situation they have in the US with local sheriffs and local police chiefs who stand for election. Because that can make that means that the police is then account the police force is accountable to the local community because they're the ones that elect them into position. Okay, so that can make the police then want to do more for the community, want to be seen, want to be shown to be part of the community because they want to be re-elected. Now, obviously, there are issues of bringing politics into the police force um, and we can see in the US that that sometimes doesn't quite work and there can be corruption and things like that. But the general idea is good in the fact that if the police feel that they are part of the community, if they feel that they are um, res res um, accountable to the community, they are more likely to then get involved and create that sense of community, which can then lower um, crime rates. So if we look at this uh, overall in terms of evaluation, it does have its strengths. There are elements of this that are good. OK, for example, we've got it backed up by research. We've got the Troubled Families Programme. We've got the Perry Preschool Programme. They're both pro studies and programmes that show that social and community projects can work. OK. And it also deals with the wider social issues that cause crime. It's looking at preventing poverty or creating a break in that cycle of poverty. It's looking at that sense of marginalization that can lead to criminal behavior by creating a sense of community. So it does have its strengths, but we also need to be aware that it is, it, it is assuming a value consensus. We know that there isn't a value consensus in society by all the diversity that we see, the diversity in families, in roles, in opportunities that people have and people take. So these programs kind of assume that everybody wants the same thing and everybody's trying to do the same thing. They want the, they want to achieve the social goals. And that may not be the case. They may have people with alternative lifestyles that don't wouldn't be helped by these social and community projects or by um, police accountability. They're also very expensive. The Perry Preschool Programme costs $1,300 per child per year. So that's $7,000 per child over the five years of preschool. OK, with it, when you've got a group of, of about 123, well, actually, it was less than that because it was half. So a, a group of just over 50, that's that's still a significant amount of money, but it's not bank breaking. If you're then rolling that out across every child in the country or in your community, they can get really expensive. And that's going to have to come from government funds, i.e. taxpayer money. So governments may be disinclined to introduce them because they can't afford them. And if they raise taxes, it's going to lose some votes. And finally, this doesn't deal with white collar or corporate crime. It only deals with street level crime. But as we said, the left realists aren't looking to cure crime or get rid of crime. What they're looking to do is reduce crime. So the next theory we're going to look at is situational crime prevention. And this really links in with the work of Ron Clark and the right realists. Now, the right realists do actually put forward two theories of crime prevention, and we'll look at the other in a few minutes. But with the right realists, they are very much of the view that crime is an individual choice, that people choose to commit crime. So if we want to prevent them or committing crime or stop them committing crime, we have to make it undesirable. We need to make sure that the cost and the consequence outweighs the benefit. And one of the ways of doing that is through situational crime prevention, which is in one respect making it so that it is harder for people to commit crime. So the harder it is to commit the crime, the less benefit there is, the more chance of getting caught, 
the higher likelihood of a consequence. So this is broken down into two parts. The first is the idea about designing out crime and what Felsen refers to as hostile architecture. So what this means is when designing a building, when designing or redesigning a building, doing renovations or anything like that, considering what it could what you need to do to reduce opportunities to commit crime. And Felsen used the example of the New York City um, Port Authority bus terminal. So in the early 90s, the bus terminal was being renovated. It was being refurbished. It was being updated. And Felsen involved himself in this process to look at how they could reduce criminal activity in the bus terminal, which to the, that point had had quite a high crime rate. So what they did is when they were redesigning the terminal, they put in place certain design features that would reduce criminal activity. So things like um, having more curved walls, making the walls curved rather than corners, because if you haven't got any dark corners, you're going to reduce criminal activity because they're, they're not dark corners to, to do illicit activity in. He also, they also looked at having um, uh, at the design of the bathrooms and reducing the size of the sinks so that homeless people couldn't use them to bathe, um, reducing the number of cubicles within the bathroom um, so that it, you had less people in there at any one time and that could create a sense of urgency, get in, get done, get out because there's a queue. Um, and also this, the idea of having the information desks and the guard desks central in the, bill, in the terminal area and circular so that the guards and the workers um, on the information desk had a 365 degree view of the building. So all of this created a situation where it was more difficult for crime to occur. The other thing they introduced was um, UV lighting in the bathrooms. So to prevent intravenous drug use, because you can't find a vein under a UV lights. Um, and by designing the building to take away the opportunities, those dark corners, those CCTV blind spots and the guards blind spots meant that there were less the people were more likely to get caught were they to engage in illicit and illegal activity and Felsen said or Felsen's study showed that there was a decrease in criminal activity once the port authority redesign was complete and the, the author and the terminal was open to public use the next idea is the idea of target hardening and what this means is rather than renovating or redesigning entire buildings it's about adding things to existing areas existing buildings existing homes to make them less um, vulnerable to criminal activity what Pease refers to as bars bolts and barriers so putting bars on your windows more locks on your doors um, living in gated communities, um, alarm systems, CCTVs and things like that, which would allow, uh, sorry, which would not allow criminal activity to take place. It makes it harder for somebody to break into your house. Think um, the purge and the ways that the houses would lock down on purge night with shutters and um, security systems and things like that just to kind of make it so that nobody could break into their house. Um, and Cornish and Clark refer also talk about notices and perhaps not necessarily putting your bars on your windows or locks on your doors and things like that, but putting up a sign that says dogs here or alarm system, CCTV in operation. It doesn't actually mean there is, but there could be. And that possibility that there could be can be would be off-putting to criminal endeavour. Okay, 
So it's the idea of making it harder to commit crime rather than preventing the causes of crime, if you like. So it's more dealing with the symptom rather than the cause. But it is about making things harder. But it's not just about homes as well. The target hardening can be done in public places. You've got homeless spikes to stop homeless people sleeping in windows and doorways. There's a bench design, which is at a slight angle, which means that people can't fall asleep on it, which again discourages the homeless. Um, toilets that require you to pay to use them, um, again, encourage, discourages people from going in there to do illicit activity if they've got to pay. Um, so th there's lots of ways that we can target harden our homes, our, our, the areas in which we frequent to make it more difficult to commit crime because then the cost and will outweigh the benefit of committing the crime. So it sounds like a good thing to do that you make it you don't leave your door wide open and allow anyone in and out of your house so by making it harder for people to commit crime surely that's a good thing and it is in some respects. So it's preemptive. It means that people are stopped from committing crime in the first place. So it's not reacting like the intervention programs were, but they're actually doing something to stop it happening in the first place. Um, and it also means that it's about people taking personal responsibility. They're not saying that the government have to provide the bars, bolts and barriers. They're saying if you want to stop crime from happening to yourself, do something about it make it harder for the criminal to do to to commit the crime against you um things like as well in in terms of our personal um safety um when you go out not walking around with your brand new phone out um all the time or having your bag shut so that people can't just stick their hands in and take your wallet and things like that um go walking in pairs or in groups rather than on your own late at night these are sort of things where you take personal responsibility. It's not about the government providing things for you, but you doing it for yourself. But it does cause what's called displacement theory. And what that means is it might reduce crime in the areas where hostile architecture and target hardening take place, but it doesn't get rid of it. It just moves it to somewhere where it's easier, where, where those opportunities are more prevalent so it's not a, it doesn't actually prevent crime it just moves it from one place to another it's also very expensive the redesigning a building is never cheap but even like target hardening your own home alarm systems are not cheap additional locks on your doors are not cheap and if you're in rented accommodation you need permission from your landlord in order to put new locks on the door. Um, you, not everyone can afford to live in a gated community. And in fact, in the UK, we have very few gated communities. So the, the, the strategies that are being suggested, yes, they, they put the responsibility back on the individual, but at the same time, if you don't have the money, then you can't prevent, you can't protect yourself. And this is particularly relevant to the working class and could be a reason why the working class tend to be victims, more likely to be a victim of crime, is because they can't afford the target hardening to be able to protect their property and protect themselves. And finally, again, doesn't deal with white collar and corporate crime. An extra lock on your door or bars on your windows will not sort of stop somebody from embezzling. OK, so we're only really dealing with street level blue collar crime. The next right realist approach comes from Wilson and Kelling and they refer to this as the environmental crime prevention approach. Now the situation on environmental kind of sound like this should be the other way around but it's not it, and it just doesn't. So make sure you do get these the right way around. So what Wilson and Kelling were referring to in terms of environmental crime prevention is about environmental improvement and the idea that if you prevent 
um, low level criminal behavior such as graffiti, broken windows, um, littering and generally the degradation of a particular area, it will lead to less criminal behavior because people will be proud of more proud of their community. And they refer to this as the broken window thesis. Deal with the broken windows, get rid of the broken windows, get rid of, rid of the graffiti. People will take more pride in their community. And then you get that um, informal social control again, where people are stopping others from doing it. So like, don't break those windows, don't do that kind of thing. And the New York City Clean Car Program is an example of this. So what they did here is they decided that with the subway cars in New York um, were full of broken chairs and seats and graffiti everywhere, broken windows and things like that. So what they decided was any carriage that had um, graffiti or broken chair or something like that would be immediately removed from circulation, cleaned up and repaired and then put back into circulation. So that when people were on the subway, they had tidy, clean carriages. And what they found was it did reduce criminal activity on the subway, in particular things like graffiti and vandalism, because other passengers would now kind of go, don't do that. So that kind of social, informal social control um, would prevent people from doing these low level criminal activities. And that links in with Wilson and Kelling's second idea, which is the idea of zero tolerance. So what they meant by this was that it's almost like sweat the small stuff come down really, really hard on the small things like graffiti and vandalism, and that will prevent people from escalating because it wouldn't be a case of, well, if I can get away with this, I wonder if I can get away with that. If I can get away with that, I wonder if I can get away with this. So rather than, rather than allowing that thought process to begin, they actually just turned around and went, we'll come down on you like a ton of bricks for the very smallest of thing and you will then not go on and do other things. So if you're going to, like possibly going to get a six month sentence um, incarceration for vandalism, you're not then going to go on to breaking and entering because if it's six months for vandalism, what's it going to be like for breaking and entering? Okay. And it really is about sweating the small stuff. If you come down hard on the small stuff and get people realizing that the consequences of committing even the smallest criminal offence is going to be harsh, it's going to stop people from A, committing the initial small offence, but also escalating to bigger and more serious offences. And finally, again, they talk about policing and the idea that you need to have more police on the streets and give police more power. Because if you if the police can do on the spot fines or um, some form of immediate restitution, then you're not burdening the criminal justice system. But you're also creating that sense of if I get caught, I'm going to get done now, not in six months time, not in a year's time when it's gone through the legal system. They can do something now. Now. Wilson and Kelling were not talking dread here. We're not talking judge dread. I am the law. I am judge, jury and execution or anything like that. They're not they weren't going that far, but they were talking about giving police more power, giving them the ability to enforce the law and do it immediately. So there isn't that lag between offence, arrest and trial. OK. OK, so again, in some respects, this is this does have benefits. So, for example, um, it is preventing escalation. If you're coming down hard on the small stuff, if you're sweating the small stuff, you're not then going to see an escalation in criminal activity. And but 
it does lead to displacement theory again. If you've got more police in certain areas, if you've got zero tolerance in certain areas, they'll just go to areas where there isn't. And we don't have that unified approach as such that allows for this to happen across the entire country and in, in be the same in every area. So we could see rather than a decline in criminal activity, we just see it moving to a new area. There's also the problem that it's a plaster. It's covering up this. It's dealing with the cause of the crime, the um, symptom of the crime, which is the graffiti or, or the broken windows, the vandalism or the petty theft and things like that. But it's not dealing with the cause of it. Why are these people committing crime? It's not looking at the social causes of criminal activity. It's just immediately going to personal responsibility. You've chosen to do it. Therefore, you will deal with the consequences. And finally, again, still ignoring white collar and corporate crime. OK, so we, we're not seeing we, we see all of these theories are really only dealing with street level blue collar crime and dealing with those cr cr crimes, probably because they are the ones that we majoritarily see in the criminal justice system. But it, none of these policies, none of these prevention systems can actually really deal with all criminal activity. So just a reminder then, your task is to make sure that you have adequate notes on the three different prevention methods that were discussed in today's lesson, making sure that you can outline them, that you can evaluate them both for strengths and limitations. And that includes the example studies that were given in terms of the um, Perry Preschool, Troubled Families, New York City Car Program, New York City Bus Terminal, um, and make sure that your um, notes grid is highlighted. If anything comes up as I don't know it or I'm not sure on this, make sure that you ask via chat or email.